Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Linux Foundation Public Health Webinar with Lily Olson and, and Damagi highlighting uh, developments during the pandemic and lessons learned from pandemic response. We'll give it just a minute here. I know there's some folks filtering in. Uh, my name is Jim St. Clair. I'm the Executive Director for Linux Foundation Public Health, and I'm thrilled to be able to work with Lily today as a LFPH Linux Foundation member uh, and uh, d discuss some of these important lessons learned and considerations uh, for the future as well. I think we're starting to get some folks in and it looks like our attendance is doing well. Uh, with that, Lily, I uh, welcome the opportunity to turn it over to you. Lily is the Director of uh, Business Development and Partnerships with Damagi and she has a presentation laid out and uh, looking forward to uh, discussing the uh, things today and as always, Feel free to uh, include any questions into the Q&A uh, that I can field and work with Lily and be happy to answer any questions you may have. Lily, take it away and thank you again. Thanks so much, Jim. So I'm gonna start just by sharing my screen. We'll get that set up. Wonderful, so thanks so much to everyone who's joining today for this talk on bringing global health best practices to US public health response. My name is Lily Olson, uh, and over the course of my career, I've served in a variety of capacities in helping frontline organizations better deliver community health services with open source technology, including on the world's largest digital nutrition system in India. I now serve as the Director of Partnerships for Demagi's U.S. Health Division, where I support our COVID-19 portfolio as well as expansion into new use cases. For the Linux Foundation uh, Public Health General members on this call, I am also your board member rep, so feel free to reach out anytime to chat. So Demagi is focused on helping organizations maximize the impact of their frontline workers with digital solutions for data collection and service delivery. We are the makers of the open source global good ComCare. We also have a large service delivery team focused on collaborating deeply with our partners, leveraging user-centered design to make sure our technology is successful. A little bit more about ComCare. ComCare is a no-code platform that can be used to quickly configure sophisticated case management solutions to enhance service delivery and data collection. ComCare is highly interoperable, can be used on and offline, and has been scaled to hundreds of thousands of users globally. Using ComCare, we've worked on about 2,000 projects in over 130 countries, and we've supported over 950,000 frontline workers to serve over 400 million people. We are really proud of the impact that we've had to date and encouraged by the impact growth we continue to see as we work towards our vision of a world where everyone has access to frontline services that they need to thrive. Today's discussion will focus on how our extensive international experience made possible our more recent domestic work in the US, where over the last two years, our team has made substantial contributions to the fight against COVID-19. I'll start by providing you an overview of our introduction to the US space over the last 24 months, and then walk through nine key insights from our international experience that informed our domestic approach. So our work in the US began with this email that we received at 1.33 AM in early March, 2020. A contact at the CDC wondered if we might be able to do something related to contact tracing in his county, Santa Clara County, California, the home of the first COVID-19 death in the US. The months that followed that email were jam-packed. <laughs> Demagi arrived on site in Santa Clara County and launched a custom contact tracing solution in just 14 days. The neighboring county of San Francisco was interested in a similar solution, a localized version of that solution. Uh, and Demagi adapted this case investigation contact tracing template for the San Francisco Department of Public Health and UCSF 
launching in seven days. Uh, later that month, a Consumer Report article called out ComCare as a front runner in the race to help health officials ramp up on contact tracing with technology. And in early May, San Francisco announced uh, ComCare as their solution of choice for contact tracing. As one of the first uh, geographies in the country to do so, this actually made national news. Um, Following San Francisco, the state of Alaska and the Navajo Nation also adopted ComCare as their solution for COVID-19 case investigation and contact tracing. In mid-May, New York State launched ComCare for contact tracing in just two weeks after engaging Demagi. The state of New Jersey and Philadelphia followed adopting ComCare, even as Pennsylvania selected uh, Sarah Alert. Johns Hopkins named ComCare a leading digital solution for contact tracing. And our final state, Colorado, conducted a two-week POC comparing four contact tracing solutions, eventually picking ComCare. Uh, this system was scaled in, in uh, Colorado by October. So around September, October, ComCare was being used by over 25,000 users for COVID-19 response in over 30 countries. We currently remain active in all of the geographies that I just mentioned, the states of Alaska, Colorado, New Jersey, New York, as well as Philadelphia and the Navajo Nation. Which brings me to the focus of our conversation today. Though the landscapes are divergent, Demagi's transition from global health to domestic revealed a lot of commonalities and best practices in designing and deploying meaningful technology solutions. We strongly believe that we succeeded in implementing tech for COVID-19 response in the United States because of our 20 years of implementation and learnings in the global south including our experience responding to the Ebola pandemic a few years ago. There are nine key insights that we believe should be applied to tech development and deployment generally across these divergent geographies. So first, paper is inescapable. Internationally, the vast majority of what we do is move community health workers and similar workforces from paper-based systems to digital tools. We did not necessarily think that that experience would translate in the U US, but in the early days of COVID-19 and to our surprise throughout the public health system, we found numerous examples of governments and community-based organizations using paper or rudimentary Excel or word-based systems. More than one county government we spoke to at the start of the pandemic was using sticky notes to track positive cases and possible contacts. Being from the US, it was a humbling moment for me to remember that we are not in any way done with the move to digital data collection. And even as we consider investments in things like AI and machine learning, there are investments to be made in the very foundation of our health tech infrastructure. Second, platforms really do help you move fast. In the US, we found that custom builds and specialized products are much more common than they are in LMICs. The US is richer, government timelines can be quite long, and the market is more saturated with a product for every use case. However, this environment is not necessarily conducive to rapidly solutioning in response to an unprecedented problem. Internationally, there's little budget for custom solutions and timelines are usually incredibly tight. We have no choice but to use an open source platform based approach to technology development. A platform enables you to move much faster because you're not building from scratch. At most, you're designing from scratch and building on a strong foundation of code base. A platform approach enables the build of something that feels custom, but isn't. We deployed our initial case investigation and contact tracing solution in 14 days and had deployed localized builds to thousands of users in a few months 
And that would not have happened without the use of a platform to expedite our build. Reflecting on our experience, it occurred to me that what a donor is to international government, state can be to local. Donors and state governments have different mandates than their recipients with an emphasis on data and reporting. Donors can't force international governments to use the tooling that they pay for, and states can't always mandate that local governments use the tooling that they pay for. As such, that tooling better be good to keep users on board. From our international experience, we knew we couldn't just design solutions that would produce good data sets. We had to design tools that would improve the jobs of users and respond to their pain points. This meant user-centered design and ongoing iterations based on user feedback for over a year. We come to this work with a strong understanding of how hard everyone's job is and we know we won't get a good data set unless the system makes work easier to do. Next, internationally, we build tools that cater to users with mixed levels of training and expertise. A typical comm care user, for example, a community health worker, often receives minimal and irregular training despite their ambitious and important public health mandate. Short-term contact tracers face the same predicament. Designing for this type of workforce goes beyond building an easy to use interface. Good design should guide users through complex workflows with scripting and advice validated by leading experts. This is especially important when public health guidelines are changing quickly. Guidance in our apps has been updated frequently over the course of the Omicron surge as quarantine timelines and other guidance has changed for positive cases or contacts who are immunized and boosted. Our international experience really prepared us to build tools that improved and standardized care in this way. Next, an old Demagi motto, open source rules. Comcare's open source code base is the product of thousands of projects worth of collaborative development effort in different solutions over the last decade. The robust and well-maintained code base is important in enabling us to respond to new problems fast, but it also enables a level of transparency and collaboration that would not be possible with proprietary solutions. For example, during the proof of concept that the state of Colorado ran evaluating ComCare against other solutions, the Office of IT was able to spend time looking at ComCare source code as part of their decision-making process. In the months that followed, as we scrambled to go live, a partner organization, Cactus, was able to take a portion of our source code, strengthen our capabilities around data import, and push their improvement back into our code base expediting the data import process for the many local governments that needed to migrate data fast. If we'd been involved in a community like this one back then, we could have tapped into an even larger number of partners to support us with platform updates related to our emergency response. That's a plug to join Linux Foundation Public Health. I've referenced throughout this talk that Demagi was involved in Ebola response several years back. Back in 2014, we worked with the Columbia Earth Institute to deploy ComCare in Guinea to support end users to, to conduct sensitization and contact tracing. A similar ComCare based solution was later deployed in Sierra Leone and collectively the solutions were used by hundreds of contact tracers for years. As a result of this years long work, Demagi had a lot of domain knowledge about how tech for contact tracing should actually work. In preparation for this talk, I was excited to find blogs from as far back as 2016 with lessons learned that very much foretell our experience with COVID. Things like using visual cues and scripting to guide busy contact tracing, considering the household and not just the individual when contact tracing maintaining flexible workforces that can be scaled up and down during an emergency, et cetera. While this might feel demagi or use case specific, a general takeaway is that internationally, 
many countries struggle with public health challenges that the U.S. has little to no modern experience with. We can and should look abroad for expertise and tooling when this happens. Starting work in the U.S., we thought it would be easier to do integrations. Anticipating higher quality systems and increased standardization than what we found abroad. That expectation was not entirely borne out in reality. Most of the places we work in the US also use bespoke systems. So our approach to and level of effort involved in integrations basically mirrored our work abroad. Luckily, we had flexible APIs because so many systems abroad are non standard. We applaud and are very invested in the move to standard APIs, but in the meantime, we find flexible APIs are a must have. Next, it's important to note that not all of our insights reflect our strengths. One challenge presented by our tech is that it's flexible and iterative builds result in flexible and sometimes unwieldy data sets. When you want flexible systems, a downside is a flexible data set that can be hard to aggregate and analyze. This is the exact same concern that we hear abroad. This is not an unsolvable problem. For good data and reporting, we believe you need to invest in good data analytics tools to assist with data transformation. Investing in data transformation unblocks you to use more flexible solutions instead of stagnant solutions that might produce a clean data set, but which your users might not love. Finally, your workforce matters. Technologists are obviously essential for the creation of successful solutions, but they aren't sufficient. Our team benefits from MDs, epidemiologists, and public health professionals that have worked on some of the greatest public health challenges of our time in some of the most remote geographies in the world. International public health is in our DNA as a company, and we bring that experience and also that passion to our work here in the US. We've heard from multiple partners that our impact first ethos is different from what they're used to, but we know it's not at all unique. They would probably find it in many of the orgs on this call that prioritize impact, open source, and collaboration over profit. And then a closing thought. In the Global South, public health work has been bottom up for a long time. Because of distributed populations, poor infrastructure, and fewer federal and regional resources, public health has focused on community health, community health workers, and local care. In the US, public health has long been top down, set by policymakers at the federal level, by national payers, et cetera. What we've observed working in both places is a striving to meet in the middle. In the US, we're finally investing in community health and community level coordinated care. Abroad, our international MOH partners are working on system strengthening and stronger top-level public health infrastructure. This positions organizations with domestic or international experience to make major contributions in the market in which they are less familiar. It's a conversation I really look forward to having in 2020. Two. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. I'll hand it back to you. Wonderful, and thank you, Lily. Uh, let's see if I can, there we go. Uh, great presentation. Uh, this is a perfect time for the audience to contribute their questions. Uh, and in the meantime, Lily, I had a few questions that I wanted to be able to run past you as well. Um, just based on that excellent presentation, some of the things that you talked about thematically, um, could you kind of give us an update on the status of your COVID work now? I, I'm, I'm, you know, things are moving so quickly, I wouldn't call anything that you presented dated, but um, um, the dimensions change on a daily basis and just kind of wondering how Omicron has potentially impacted some of what you discussed. Yeah, it's a great question. Omicron uh, was uh, through a wrench and I think where we otherwise thought these projects were headed. 
Um, you know, we've been supporting these geographies for almost two years uh, in, in most cases. Um, the systems are reaching an increased uh, state of stability. And so the need for, you know, rapid iteration is decreasing. Um, what we were seeing in, you know, renewals with our partners is that they were able to, uh, uh, you know, they required a smaller services team, maybe looking at six week instead of three or four week agile sprints, and then came Omicron. <laughs> and Omicron, you know, as we all witnessed, the CDC uh, updates to guidelines were daily. By the time we'd uh, executed a change in the app, that change might be outdated based on new guidance from the CDC. So there was a real feel uh, of, of all hands on deck that you know, reminded us of really our early days of response. Um, we are beginning to think with our partners about you know, what they want their third year of using our systems to look like. And I think where our partners are struggling is not knowing what to plan for. Do we plan for the next variant or do we plan for you know, a, a more stable COVID environment? So most of our contracts are just likely to include a level of flexibility that allows for both. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. I think we, we thought, we hoped that our, our projects would be um, wrapping up in the same way that I think we all thought and hoped that we would be returning to a, a normal post COVID world at this point. Yeah, and I would also build on the comments about flexible data and data systems. Um, have you noticed with any of your customers that in doing the work specific to COVID and of course the emergency response for COVID, um, in educating them on data governance and, and managing their data systems and what kind of data they have, have you had the opportunity to suggest, you know, one other focus here you could have or one other consideration beyond COVID for this data is to do X around this, around the population. I don't know if you're aware of any conversations like that have taken place or if any public health authorities are starting to look in that direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, a trend that I think we've all observed is an influx of funding in public health generally above and beyond COVID. And then funding for COVID that can be used to build stronger infrastructure that can be used for the next use case. So I think that in, in parallel, sort of the strengthening of certain data lake products has really instigated conversations with a lot of our partners about better approaches to data management. Um, I, I don't expect this to be a, a conversation that uh, progresses incredibly fast. Um, you know, the, the rules in the United States around data ownership and data privacy and data sharing are really complicated. Um, and so aggregating data from multiple sources into single data lakes um, those are multi-year processes and conversations for our partners at the state level, but we are definitely seeing them kick off. Um, and I think COVID really has inspired exploration into these tools. As an example, in the state of Colorado, uh, the data analytics infrastructure that was presented on one of my slides, the use of Talend, Snowflake, and Tableau, was essentially trialed by the state for their case investigation and contact tracing work, very much with an eye to potential use of those tools across the departments of health and energy at some point in the future. For broader applications to other things that the, exactly. the public health authorities are challenged by. That makes perfect sense. Um, you emphasized open source and a platform for, for scaling quickly. The, the tech's not already up to speed in some cases. And as you pointed out, you saw a lot of variation from location to location, I'm sure, in terms of the type of tech you encountered. Uh, did you see anything from an open source infrastructure or a challenge there that enabled you to implement faster or particular things that you saw that were a challenge that always impeded you more? You know, how did open source kind of contribute to that landscape? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the main ways that our code source needed to be utilized in these projects was around integrations. Um, and so making accessible our, our code, our APIs uh, to partners that, you know, like some state governments, they want to execute their own integrations um, between the systems that they uh, implement. Um, so that, that was one very tangible way that being an open source platform really expedited our work and our ability to, um, to deploy quickly. You know, I think the other great power of open source and, and these uh, code bases that are, are curated and maintained 
um, is that they're ready. <laughs> they're essentially ready to go uh, and, and to be used for something very, very quickly um, in a way that if you're building from scratch, you know, you, you're looking at a years long timeline. Fantastic. And if I could ask for uh, one last question as a shameless plug, I would love your perspective as a member and to share with folks on the uh, on the webinar who aren't members yet but are considering it, you know, just what you see in the dynamics of the Linux Foundation and working with LFPH that are of benefit to Damagi and the efforts that we have underway. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, open source is an increasingly sort of recognized concept and important priority in the public health departments that we are partnered with. And the power of LFPH is it's a meeting of two worlds. It's a meeting of these open source technology organizations and public health department employees. It's not, you know, a place to pitch your tech, uh, but it is a place to better understand each other and each other's needs and the ways that open source can really contribute to the, the ambitious efforts that these public health departments have. So I would really encourage those that aren't yet a member of the community to take a look. Um, you know, Jim and I are both around if you want to talk about uh, the network and, and to talk about the ways that it can support you to better understand the landscape, uh, to improve your offering so that it is really valuable for advancing our, our public health aims in the U.S. Great. Fantastic. And thank you very much for that clarification and additional information. It doesn't appear that we have any other questions coming in from the audience. So I'd be very happy to turn it over to you in the last minutes if you had any closing thoughts or anything else that you wanted to address that we may not have. Yeah, I think, you know, a final thought um, is Damagi and uh, others in this network um, really kicked off in the United States in response to COVID-19. Um, you know, we are not the only organization that wasn't very active in this market until there was this urgent need to respond to COVID-19. Um, so one of the really important conversations that I look forward to having with other members of this network in 2022 is what contribution we can make post COVID-19, you know, how our tools can be adapted uh, to other really important public health use cases. Um, COVID-19 protocol is unique, but components of that protocol are not. Um, and so thinking about how to take your solutions and pivot them for a similar use case how to take the partnerships that you've built over these past couple of years and grow them uh, into new opportunities. Um, this will be, you know, I think something that I know LFPH is thinking about and that I suspect many of our members are thinking about as well. Absolutely. Well, again, we don't have any other further questions. And Lily, thank you very much for your time today. I think this has been an excellent presentation, certainly very topical. And thank you again for your support with LFPH. And uh, this will be recorded and available on the website. And if anyone has any additional questions, you're more than uh, welcome to contact me or Lily, uh, or we could arrange for uh, participation in an LFPH event so that you can learn more. Uh, I hope that everyone has a uh, great rest of your day. Thank you very much for participating and look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you.